This is Annie Grace, and you're listening to this Naked Mind podcast, where without judgment, pain, or rules, we explore the role of alcohol in our lives and culture. Hi, this is Annie Grace, and welcome back to this Naked Mind podcast. So I've probably been excited about doing this specific interview for about three to four weeks now. Um, And I've even written it in the newsletter. It's just such an honor because Alex Sharfin has got to be one of my favorite people on the entire planet. And thank you so much for being here, Alex. Oh, Annie, thanks for the introduction and thanks for having me. So um, let me tell everybody a bit how how I know and met Alex. So basically... um, I've had been really blessed that I've written this book and now I've had the opportunity to kind of quit my job and move into doing this more or less full time. And I've gotten, you know, just this huge amount of momentum with this message and now this podcast and other books and programs and all sorts of things are happening. And where was I in all that? I I really got swept up in it (laughs) in a very, very intense way, uh, wanting to just pour out and give and give and give. And I met Alex and, and he really keyed into this. We met at a marketing conference that we were both at and he keyed into this almost immediately. And, um, and I've since started working with Alex, like as a, a personal coach, which has been just incredible. But I think Alex's gift is that he can come in and see somebody who wants to make a contribution, who wants to change the world. And he's done so much research and analysis on the types of people who have this kind of in them that he can say, okay, here's here's some framework, here's some architecture to take care of yourself and your body and your psyche so that you can give back. And so for my my life has changed just working with Alex. And I am so excited to have him on here because I think not only Alex in your own personal journey, but just in so many avenues and aspects, everything that you talk about, Alex, um, not only does he consult with just some of the most incredible people as a business coach, but he also has this amazing podcast called The Momentum Podcast which has just by itself, I think, changed my life. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm just so excited to have you on. Thanks, Annie. That's one of the best intros I've ever had from the heart. I appreciate it. <laughs> That's awesome. So why don't you tell us, I mean, one of the things that, you know, you just sort of set off the cuff to me when we first met, you're like, I love your work. I didn't I haven't had a drink in 14 years. So can you just start there and tell me about your journey? Sure. Um, you know, I, I think like so many entrepreneurs, um, alcohol was a big part of my business. It was a big part of my life. You know, I, I, uh, through a series of fortunate events, when I was 21 years old, I became a consultant at the fortune 500 level. And, um, it was a big leap, Andy, like I wasn't ready for it. I didn't have everything that I should have. And I didn't have the experience to be given the opportunity that I had, but I took advantage of it once I did. And, and one of the, one of the almost requirements of my job was to take people out to, to, entertain, take them out to clubs, you know, show them a good time. Like that's part of consulting. It's part of relationship building. And so for the entire time that I owned that business, uh, alcohol and going out and um, entertaining was, it was like a part of it. And I realized um, when I was, when I met Katie, my wife, I realized I didn't want to be part of that business anymore. And I didn't want to travel all the time and not be present for for a family. And Katie and I started right away talking about having kids and getting married. And and I realized like she raised the importance level of my life high enough that um, that it was it was like everything in my life got more important. And so I started really thinking about, you know, how much I was drinking and how much it was taking away from my life. And even after I sold my company, I was still drinking three or four nights, sometimes five or six nights. And let's be honest, sometimes every night of the week. And um, I woke up one day and realized, like, if I didn't stop that, that it was it was becoming like a second job. Because I think anyone who drinks routinely realizes after a while that like if you have enough to drink at night, you're recovering for the next day. And then you're really just trying to get to the point where you can have another drink and make the pain go away. And then it becomes this vicious cycle. And I was in it. And, you know, um, in all candor, I grew up in a 12 step household. My mom was part of how and OA, the overeating or you know, food part of 12 step. And I watched how restrictive it was, how difficult it was. I actually went to an AA meeting. Honestly, I, I've, I've never wanted to drink more than when I left the AA meeting. 
And, and I think a lot of people have that same reaction. And for me, it was like, I woke up one day and said, okay, this is like, this has to change. I didn't hit like the quote unquote bottom that everybody talks about. I wasn't laying in a gutter somewhere. I wasn't like, you know, near death or anything. I just, I realized that if I was going to create what I wanted in the world and have the type of family I wanted, that alcohol was just taking too much of it away. And so from one day to the next, I stopped. I mean, it was, it's not the easiest way to do it, but um, once I made that decision that life had become more important than drinking, it was just something I did. Oh, I love that. Life has become more important than drinking. I love that. That's just such a pivotal point. So just to give kind of the audience an idea, um, you share a statistic about how, what percentage of businesses grow to be $10 million companies, right? What, what percentage is that? So, so 1 million to get to 1 million, it's only 3% of companies to get to 10 million. It's four out of every thousand point zero four percent Okay, so 0.04% of businesses have become $10 million companies. And just to give the audience a perspective of your success and your contribution, you've grown six companies to $10 million. Yeah, and one to over to about $250 million. And um, yeah, I mean, it, it, that, that, that's a, yeah, it's a... It's, a <laughs> it's like, I mean, let's just take a minute to understand that... That level, and what I love about business in general, okay, so I come from a business, marketing, corporate world, um, and business can get kind of a bad rap, but honestly, it is, and what I love about Alex's mission, it is people starting businesses with the intention of giving something that the world needs back to the world and changing the world. So it's not just that, you know, um, you're kind of, I mean, you're this tiny fractional percentage of the population that can even do this, can even grow a single company to a million, much less six to 10 million, one to 250 million. Um, but I know you well enough to know that these companies had a mission of just contribution. And yeah. what I'd love for you to do is just kind of tie in that incredible, like serious astronomical level of success with um, this idea of, you know, you, you say something and you're going to say it much better than I do just about how we have this compulsion in us that like makes us focus on certain things. And sometimes, unfortunately, that's alcohol. And I think a lot of it's, it's surprising to me, my readers, people who write me letters every day, they are doctors, they are lawyers, they are psychiatrists, they are, you know, school counselors, they're bodybuilders. They, they are some of the most successful people. They are incredibly and it's people who you wouldn't imagine struggle with alcohol um and, and so can you just talk a little bit about why is this relationship with success so tied in with this relationship with with drinking you know i i think when you when you look at who we are as people and and with the the categories you just named like doctors and lawyers and bodybuilders and you know I just, I don't think we're like the rest of the crowd. You know, we get up every day and we ask the question, how can I make this bigger and more important and more significant? And, you know, Annie, my, my construct of the world is totally different. I've done a, done a ton of research on human behavior and what makes us like we are. And I have this theory on the world that there's really four different types of people. And when you look at those four different types of people, the one that we are is hardwired different. But let me just, let me let you and all of your readers self-qualify because I want to take you through this journey because it helps understand why we're hardwired in a way that will keep us going back to the same thing over and over again, even though it's not moving us forward. So when you look at the first group of people in the world, I call them the caretakers. Like these are people who want to take care of other people. And I'm sure there's people listening that are like, oh, that must be me. But I want to ask the question. So, Annie, do you like to change bedpans? No. <laughs> right. So, and you asked, you answered it quick, but check this out, Annie. In the world, like I've, I've talked to people that really do like to change bedpans. They will say like, hey, if the bedpan needed changing and I was there to change it, I, I feel like I was service. I, you know, I, I, I provided a service to that person. I feel fulfilled. Honestly, I feel like I should have written a bigger check. So like, let's, let's put that person. So you're not, you're not one of those caretakers. So let's look at the second group of people. These are the communicators. These are people who like to talk. They like to communicate anything. Historically, I think that they were the people who carried on oral tradition for our greater human tribe. The question on communicator is Annie, do you like small talk? Oh no, I, I really hate small talk. <laughs> you and I both. 
<laughs> when when I get into a small talk situation, I am like my whole body starts shaking. I'm like, how do I escape? Because I feel trapped. And the reason for for that, like we're not communicators. You put two communicators in a water cooler, they can talk 45 minutes about a half hour TV show. So the third group of people in the world, I call these the coordinators. They're the ones that like like to put things in order. They like to 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 they like fine print. They like contracts, not because there's a deal, but because there's a contract. The qualification question on this one is. Um, do you enjoy being on committees? No, no, <laughs> no, right? no. And because people like us, like just the very opening of a committee, the wrapping of the gavel, all that stuff that happens, it drives us nuts. And so if you're not, you know, you, we look at our evolutionary human tribe, we needed caretakers. We still need them today. We needed communicators. We still need them today. We need the coordinators. So what's missing? What's that fourth group? See, I believe that that fourth group is the evolutionary hunters, the people who are hardwired every day to get up and say, how do I make things better? What do I change? What am I going to do today? How do I improve the world around me? And evolutionary hunters are driven different than the rest of the world. And here's the qualification question for an evolutionary hunter. Can you turn it off? No. <laughs> no. No. And so if we, you know, you think of any of whatever your construct is for how human beings arrived on this planet, whether it's divine intervention, whether it's creation, however it is, the fact is that when you look at the human species, there had to be some type of a higher level of intelligence that created us. And I think that our small little group of evolutionary hunters were, were definitely the smaller group in the world. And I think that that we are the group that is hardwired to get up, go forward, create momentum, do something, make things happen. And we do not like to feel a loss of forward motion. Do you know what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. Like we don't like to feel that lull, that slowdown. And so here's what happens. When we perceive a loss of momentum, we will move towards unintentional consumption. And Annie, when I say unintentional consumption, I include alcohol, I include pornography, I include podcasts, marketing pages, like people like us will dive headfirst into anything looking for momentum. And here's what you and I both know. If you are out of momentum and you start drinking, suddenly everything in the world feels easier. Mm -hmm. And if, if things aren't going your way and you drink, it numbs the pain of what's going on. And it just the same way as if you turn on a podcast and listen to six or seven of them in a row, it takes you out of that feeling of lost percent or lost momentum. But here's the challenge. When we move towards unintentional consumption, we feel a little bit of gain. Like, do you remember when you used to go drinking, you'd make the decision, oh, I'm going to go out to a bar. That would feel like momentum, right? Then you go to the bar, you have a few drinks. It feels like even more momentum. Then what happens is because we are evolutionary hunters, because we're hardwired to make sure that we're moving forward, at some point we get this question that says like, hey, did we actually create momentum? And we didn't because there was no goal. The goal was just numb the pain, make it easier. And so what happens in our minds is like, hey, we didn't create momentum. Um, everybody else looked like they were in momentum. Maybe I, I can't verify that I move forward in any way. So what do we do? We go right back and start over. And it puts us in what I call this entrepreneurial loop where we keep doing the same thing over and over again. And Annie, you know, alcohol is one way we do this, but I'll explain it to you in a different way. When I look at entrepreneurs or when I look at people who who are doing things and making things happen. And, and you know, your listeners for the most part, they're out there making things happen in the world. That's why they're coming to you. They wanna make it better. And when you look at people like you perceive loss of momentum, let's take alcohol out of the equation. I'll explain it in a gentler way. Somebody doesn't feel like they're moving forward and then they say, I'm gonna go attend an industry conference or I'm gonna go find an event to go to. And so the second they make that decision, we get a chemical hit. Here's why. If we're evolutionary hunters deciding to go on the hunt, you had to get a hit of, of adrenaline. You had to get a little hit of dopamine, serotonin, because hunting, there's no way we should be logically saying, let's go grab a few sticks and hunt something. Evolutionarily, there had to be a reward there. Mm -hmm. And then as we went on the hunt, you go to the conference, the difference between making the decision and actually attending the conference, we get this massive hit of serotonin, dopamine, adrenaline, all the stuff that we want. And then we go to the conference, we experience it, and then we have that same question in our head that pops up sooner or later. You know, anyone who's been to a Tony Robbins conference knows this feeling. It's like height of adrenaline and feeling and momentum. And then six months later, you're going, what really happened? 
Like, did I apply it? Did, did I actually make something happen? And then the question like, have I moved forward? Did I create momentum? And then you feel like you're back where you started and what do we do? We go back to another conference. And when I look at drinking or any of the things that we, people like us get addicted to, it's that loop where we don't really know where we're going. Like nobody has ever said, I've got this really important goal, so I'm gonna go out to a bar, right? And if you did, it probably wasn't that important of a goal. You were confused, but it, you know, most of the time it's, I'm going out to a bar because I'm tired or I'm exhausted, or, you know, I want to, I want to go feel some, some camaraderie. I want to like shake the feeling I have right now. But when we look at who we really are and if we really want to achieve, it's getting clear on our outcome and then moving towards it that actually moves us forward as human beings. Oh yeah. Yeah. That's, that's amazing. I think that's so true. And once you, there's an incredible number of people who have um, read my book and then gone on to do stuff like this. Like there's a guy who's opened um, sort of gemstone online business and he just like really found his thing. There's a few people that, that are mutual friends of ours who have just in the last 30 days since they both, their business partners gave up alcohol, they changed their entire business structure and model and they've like catapulted it in a way that they've never had before because they found that focus. There's a woman who, um, she's a flight attendant. She found my book, she stopped drinking and now she's launched a whole business called Flying Through Life Sober for other flight attendants, which, that's you know, awesome. over and over, I think that's true when you, and it almost is, correct me if I'm wrong, a lot of people talk about you give something up, drinking, alcohol, and then you feel this huge <laughs> void and so unless you have, so how, how can you cross that chasm really of, of okay, here's the void, um, now I need to find where I'm going. Like, is there any direction you could? Oh, absolutely. You know, um, when we, when we are, are drinking to numb pain or to create momentum or to feel better about what's going on, I think we do that for one reason. We don't have ultimate clarity on what we really want and we haven't made it important enough. And when we sit down and we get really clear and very congruent as to what we want in our lives, we will very quickly see that, that alcohol pre prevent, presents a barrier and that most addictive behaviors present a barrier. But here's the challenge. You know, we talk about addictive behavior as it applies to alcohol as being negative. But then when we bring up something from history, like 10,000 tries to make a light bulb, you know, Thomas Edison, you want to talk about addictive behavior, spent months at Menlo Park blowing glass tubes and using different types of filaments to and passing electricity through them and exploding things in his garage when he over 10,000 times in order to turn night into day. And when you look at that, I mean, let's be honest, today Edison would be on some type of an anti-schizophrenic medication for OCD and we'd be sitting here in the dark. And so when, when I look at addictive behavior, anyone who's listening to this who's like, yeah, I think I do have some addictive behaviors, I want you to know you have the behaviors of brilliance because throughout history, when we see someone get like caught up in an addiction, you know, Picasso's blue period, was a period it, 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 today, it's considered a period in art history. So a period in art history was created by a single person going through to a day what we would call an extended period of depression that he painted his way out of. And so when you look at who we are and what we're doing, it's how do you elevate what is in your life to a higher level of importance than the alcohol? And I, and then Annie, I, I don't know any other way to do it. You create your behavior around that thing. You transition the time you spend drinking to that to the new thing. You transition the time you spent recovering to creating the outcome you want in the world. And I think that's what's so important about what you're doing here because when you look at the 12-step version of the quitting drinking process, you know it's almost a mantra in those groups where they say, well, you have to hit bottom in order to stop drinking. It, it's almost like license to go completely screw up your life so you can go, okay, cool, I, I hit bottom. Well, I never did that, you never did that, and most of the people that I've worked with that have quit drinking have never done that. They get up one day and they say, man, my, my life is elevated in importance, I'm gonna stop. I also have a couple of clients that um, I've been working with since July, and they weren't heavy drinkers, they were so, what we would call social drinkers, but they were going out a few nights a week and drinking, and they were recovering from it. And when we got together, I explained to him, hey, you can keep doing that, 
But if what you're doing is really important, you know, I, I think you've got a hundred million dollar business sitting in front of you and four out of a thousand people get to 10 million. It's a tiny, tiny fraction of 1% that ever even thinks about a hundred million. And if the two of you want to do it, you might be able to get there drinking, but I know it's not going to help you. And they quit and they've gone from about a million dollar business in July to about a $10 million business today. They've already made up that much space. And I'm not saying that everyone who quits, quits drinking is going to do that, but I know that when you quit drinking and you imply that energy to something else, you will get massive results. Yeah, that's phenomenal. There's a writer, his name is Augustin Burroughs. He wrote Running with Scissors, among a bunch of other things. And in his memoir, he basically said that he didn't, he didn't actually quit with a lot of help. It was that writing became more important to him. Telling his story became more important to him than alcohol. And yeah. I think, you know, I spoke to a woman yesterday. She's a doctor of chiropractic. I had her on the pod, podcast. And for her, it was her legacy for her two teenage sons. They were finally turning of age, and she realized the example she was giving them. And suddenly it, it became more important than the alcohol. And, you know, when you think about it, like, Alcohol is like a liquid in a glass that, you know, makes you feel sick, gives you an initial buzz, then makes you feel sick and um, ultimately, you know, like maybe numbs some feelings or gives you an endorphin rush artificially for a little while. Like, how can that be more important than so many things? And I think obviously the answer is why just a huge societal influence and we, we just have gotten our priorities a bit wrong, not only from that, but also because the thing that you're talking about, like if we go back to the blue period, um, it was permission to live in discomfort in order to create, you know, boredom by definition is uncomfortable, but that's also when we start to create like nothing amazing. We, we have to be, Edison probably had to be pretty bored to try that 10,000 times, right? So we yeah. have these emotions that in our society we've said, oh, we should never be bored. We should never be depressed. We should never experience pain. And so we try to numb things that actually further our evolution, like further our um, capacity to contribute unknowingly because we just have been told since birth by every single marketing agency and every single TV commercial that you should just run from discomfort. But I mean, there's nothing brilliant that's ever happened from even a first date is uncomfortable, right? Like your first meeting with your first kiss of your wife was uncomfortable, brilliant, but uncomfortable. Like there's nothing good that's ever come without a level of, of discomfort. There's no question. I think when you, you know, not think part of my story is, you know, I've, I've obsessed over success for most of my life. And part of that obsession has been reading the life histories and the third party accounts and the biographies or autobiographies of successful people. I've read thousands, Annie. It's, it's, it's an obsession. That's an addiction of mine is like, I can't stop. If I pointed the camera over here, I've got hundreds of books in my office and I've got like 15 lined up over here that I'm slowly working my way through this month. And, um, the more that I research, the more that I, that, that I look at successful people, the more you see these commonalities, the more you see this personality type coming out. And when you look at successful human beings that have changed the world, that have left their mark, that, that we remembered, anyone who matters to be remembered has gone through cognitive dissonance and challenges and trials and frustrations and periods where they didn't even know if they would make it. And, you know, then they had a breakthrough and, and they saw this, this light, you know, Einstein couldn't tie his shoes his whole life. He wore slip-ons. He couldn't talk until he was four years old. He failed algebra class. It was in his second time through algebra. He was looking at the clock and he thought like, what if, what could, what if I could escape this class? What if I could escape this class and become the beam of light hitting that clock? What if I could escape this class and become the beam of light in front of the clock? Or sorry, what if I could get in front of the beam of light and hit the clock? And that's where the theory of relativity was originally born. And you look at that level of like cognitive dissonance that, you know, in today's society, we're told, take a pill, see a psychiatrist, you know, have a drink, um, do, do something so that you don't feel that way. And the fact is that every period of cognitive dissonance, every period of trial or tribulation has an equal and opposite greater success that we can achieve. The challenge is when we go into that period of trial and tribulation, that period of cognitive dissonance, and we drink it away, we eliminate that other side. We take away that equal and opposite success, and we just stay in that trial. Yeah, 
No, oh, that's brilliant. And I think one of the main things that, you know, when someone says, oh, you have an addictive personality or, or you're just destined for this or this isn't your genes or whatever the case is, um, it, I think that it's these qualities, you know, these qualities of wanting more, of needing more, of finding, like, that lead to, yeah, probably drinking too much, but they also lead to doing incredible things. It, it's the same thing. So, you know, we, we wear it as like, oh, there's something wrong with me. No, no, there's something right with you, you know? And I think that's sometimes the message, the only message we need to hear is like, wait a second, I'm okay just how I am. Maybe I've just been, um, you know, using this, just the belief that I'm not okay how, how I am could keep you drinking. And if you just can accept, like, it's okay to feel sad sometimes. It's okay to feel depressed. It's okay to feel everything I feel. Um, we can find, like, a lot of freedom in that. No question. And I think that, you know, for 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 everyone listening, if, if you look throughout history at the people who actually changed the world, they did so by going through an extended period of difficulty, every one of them. You know, and 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 uh, that struggle, that loss of momentum, that frustration, that place where we get stuck. You know, I, here here's what I know about people like you and I. If we get to that place in our lives where all we can see is a tiny light at the end of the tunnel, and the rest of the world around us is saying like, "Hey, Annie, it's a train," <laughs> and we don't don't when we deny that and we keep going forward and we move towards that light and we compel it towards us and we finally step through it, that's where we define our lives. That's where we become who we are. And I think that in so many ways in today's society, we're told, hey, if you're frustrated or upset or slowed down or confused or don't feel like you're feeling great and, you know, there's not birds chirping and the sun's not shining, you know, come and have a drink, have a beer, have a glass of wine, have, take a pill and everything will get better. And the fact is that anything that masks us going through that, that tunnel, going through that light takes away who we are. And that's why I think your work is so critically important because this is another option for those people who who have, you know what, is addictive behavior so bad? You know, in a lot of ways, when we look at anyone that we respect in the world has an addictive behavior. I'll give you an example. I took my kids to see Taylor Swift, which I know is a weird example, but I've been around a lot of performers. I've, I've spent a lot of time on TV. I've spent a lot of time around, I actually was on TV for about 10 years at Home Shopping Network. I've been a lot, around a lot of quasi celebrities and watching Taylor Swift perform was transformative. Like I didn't expect it to be. I actually expected to be really annoyed. I was blown away. Annie, she blinks on cue. Like there's a huge, huge TV, screen that shows her and as she's singing like she literally looks like animatronic she blinks on cue she moves on cue she says things at exactly the same time she's got like she makes a look on stage and it's amplified a hundred times bigger than she is and it's perfect and when i think of what it takes to make an entire production like that two hours without one miss with and, and and it just looks so incredible and takes you into her world in this way that like you don't see anything wrong with what she's doing because there isn't. That is an insanely addictive behavior that drives that. But she's using it in a way where I want my girls to go to that concert. I want them to listen to what she says. She talks about being different and, and how she's not like everybody else and how she embraces who she is. And then she gets up there and she puts on this performance that you know every single thing she's done has been planned. That's just as addictive as going out and drinking every night. And the fact is, if you look at everyone in history who you remember, who matters to be remembered, they were addicted to something. And they were, they were, they had this, this intense focus on something. And today we don't respect that anymore. We say like, if you have an intense focus, if, if you want to do something really bad, if, if you can't give it up, then you must have an addiction. And the fact is, that anyone who's ever changed the world was addicted to what they were doing. Oh, I love that. It gives me chills. It's so cool. <laughs> um, let me ask you, sort of switching gears, I have two, two more questions, and I know I've, I've already kept you on for a long time, but um, first of all, your work has been, like I said, just so important in my life, and I know we're just getting started, but one of the things that, like, it, and it's so funny, it's so the opposite of what you imagine a coach is going to say, um, but you said, 
Okay, first thing you need to do is like really hyper hydrate and you need to get, um, just start to drink more water and there's all this science behind it. And I think based on your knowledge of kind of how the body works and the physiology and stuff, I know there's people listening who no longer drink, but there's a lot of people listening who are just kind of like, huh, I don't know, like maybe I do want to drink less or maybe I want to stop or maybe like they're just toying with the idea. So um, can I pick your brain about any advice you have for somebody who's like, okay, I know that like there's going to be a de detoxification happening and, and just, you know, any, any advice even beyond the water that, you know, you could give um, yeah, based absolutely. on your knowledge. Absolutely. So um, I'm, I'm happy you pointed this out, Annie. I'm, I'm a very odd business coach. I work with wildly successful people like you. And where I start is physiological foundation, because here's how I look at people like us. We are physiologically sensitive, momentum-based beings that are highly reactive to constraint. And if you look at the research from about 200 years ago to about 6,000 years ago, there's this massive body of research that says water changes everything. It says when we hydrate, we connect mind and body, we understand where we are, we become more aware, we become more present. And in today's society, we completely ignore that. When you look at the top 50 prescription drugs in the United States, they treat the symptoms of diseases that we've identified, but they also treat the symptoms of dehydration because dehydration causes mental issues, stomach issues, pains, aches, um, swelling, uh, inflammation, um, all kinds of different issues in the body, like slowdown of digestion. You look at all of those drugs and you can make the argument that 100% of them are treating the symptoms of dehydration. And so when I work with somebody, especially someone who's going through like the process of quitting drinking, we obsess over water because here's what happens and you're, you're doing this so you know, the more water you drink, the more mind and body connected you get. The more water you drink, this is weird, but the more momentum you feel. And here's what's interesting. The more water you drink, the more you feel compelled to act in a, in a healthier way. Um, this is an interesting story, Annie. I had a, a receptionist um, and she was she worked in our office for a while. And when we, her name was Kim, just an awesome woman. And when we hired Kim, she was probably about 150 pounds overweight and was diabetic. She was using three syringes of insulin a day. And um, when I hired her, I said, hey, you know, most of the people who work here, we really follow a healthy lifestyle. We drink a lot of water. You know, are you willing to do some of those things? And she said yes. And so she started working with us and she didn't really change her diet or anything intentionally. She just started drinking more water using our hyperhydration program. She lost 90 pounds in an eight month period. She went from using three syringes of, of uh, or three um, vials of insulin to using less than one per month and completely changed her entire life. And here's how I equate that. You drink more water, you get into your body more, and you start being more present, you start being more aware. And that physiological change will connect you in a way that's different than what, what you're doing right now. And so for anyone who's ready to quit drinking or thinking about it, start healthy habits and get addicted to those. When you start drinking water, walking in the morning, eating healthier, you start connecting your mind and body in a way that when you do go drink, you feel it in a different way. You start like feeling the slowdown, feeling the loss of momentum, feeling like you're kind of running through molasses the next day, and it makes it so much easier to let go of, of the alcohol. Yeah, because honestly, when, when you are giving up something that you feel like is contributing to your life, it's very painful. When you're giving up something that you've realized is just not contributing and is actually a barrier to the life you want, it becomes not only not painful, but when I quit drinking, I was giddy. <laughs> like I was pretty yeah. euphoric because it was like, I never have to do that again. I can make this this change in this decision. And before I forget, you have something called the Natural Thirst Challenge. Where can we find that? So if you go to getthirstynow.com, um, that is a 10 day challenge where you drink water in a very specific way with a very specific set of directions. And what the goal of that program is, is to wake up your natural thirst instinct. See, my theory is that thirst is a very subtle instinct. And you know this because every one of us has gotten up in the morning, thought to ourselves, man, I'm kind of thirsty. I should get some water, then looked up and it's four o'clock in the afternoon and we haven't had any water. 
Like we will suppress that instinct. We will ignore it. It'll go dormant and it'll just go away. And so we use this process in the natural thirst challenge where over the course of 10 days, you reawaken that instinct. And most people who have done that challenge start drinking anywhere from about like 200 to 400 ounces of water a day. They feel ridiculous physiological momentum and their lives change just from the consumption of water. It's funny, Annie, you know, I'll go back to something I said earlier. When I read the life histories of successful people, it's uncanny how many of them were obsessed with hydration and water, because I think that the those of us who like want to do more, who want to create more, we become sensitive to what helps. We become sensitive to what creates momentum. We become sensitive to what makes us feel more vital and alive and drinking water for 100 percent of human beings will do that. If anyone's listening and you're thinking, well, I don't really like water, that's a symptom, not a preference. And the 10 day natural thirst challenge will help you out of that. Oh, that's so cool. And he said, getthirstynow.com. Getthirstynow.com. It's a little play on words that I didn't really realize I was doing. Someone told me a long time afterwards that like thirsty means like getting busy as well. So oh. <laughs> we have that double entendre there. <laughs> well, no, I named my book This Naked Mind. So. I understand. <laughs> That's awesome. And I think that this is such a relevant topic of conversation because, you know, alcohol, we know it's a diuretic, but it actually reduces the um, chemicals in your body that keep you hydrated. So it, it reduces your ability to feel thirst even more than without drinking. So not only does it like purge your body of water, but then it reduces your natural ability to feel thirst. So alcohol um by itself one of the reasons you could just be feeling so crappy is because you are dehydrated and alcohol just does that in such a profound way um so i have one more question for you alex um one of the things that i think people struggle with so much is that we are as human beings we evolutionary we need to fit into a tribe we need to be part of a group and that's, you know, originally, obviously, it came for survival reasons. So it can feel our group has been the group at the bar, the, the group of moms in the drinking play date situation, the group of dads at the, you know, beer guzzling football games. And, and this has been our group. And so when we take ourselves and elevate ourselves and say, hey, I'm, I'll go to the play date, but I'm not going to drink any more wine with you or, or go to the football game and not drink any more beer, it can feel really alienating and we can feel really alone. And since you've been through this yourself and just also with all of your um, expertise, I'd love you to just comment on 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 that idea and, and if you have any advice for people. Yeah, I mean, you know, here's here's the the challenge with having a social group that revolves around drinking is that you don't really have a social group. You have a drinking group. Because 100% of human beings modify behavior when they drink. I've never met a single person who can act exactly the same before and after. And drinking affects everything. Like as soon as we consume alcohol, it affects our hormonal patterns. It affects our chemical patterns. It affects how we speak, how we breathe. Um, it takes away the deepest levels of sleep and recovery. So it doesn't matter how much you sleep. If you've been drinking that night, chances are you're not going to hit deep sleep. You're not going to really get that full restorative sleep. So it alters who we are as a person in the moments that we're drinking and even ongoing. And what happens is when we give that up and we go back to those groups, I don't know if this happened to you, Annie, but for me, it, I very quickly realized those groups weren't somewhere I wanted to be. It did feel isolating, it felt alienating, but felt alienating. But the more that I went back to the groups, the more I realized like there's nothing here if you're not drinking. It's uncomfortable if you're not drinking. In fact, here's what I realized, and I think a lot of maybe you will, is that if I wasn't drinking, it wasn't a place I wanted to be. And then I backed that up and and I came to the realization that it didn't matter what I was doing, it really wasn't a place I wanted to be. And I think that that happens to a lot of us. And, and you have to lean into those feelings because what we want to do initially is deny them and say, no, this is comfortable. It's a status quo. This is what I've been doing forever. We want to actually say like, hey, I can make this OK. I'll just go and I won't have a drink. I'll go and I'll drink club soda. It just it, it's not the same. And the the whatever chemical benefit you were getting, whatever physiological benefit you were getting from that group, it's going to shift consist considerably. And what I encourage my clients to do, what I encourage, what I did was I went and I found new social groups. I figured, you know, I figured out that like if you stay healthy 
and you lean into health and you lean into, you know, bettering yourself, you create an entirely different tribe around you that supports who you're becoming. And I, I have this saying that I give clients when they're going through a transition, I, I tell them to make the decision, not for the person they are, but for the person they want to become. And, you know, one of the things that I encourage anyone who has a social drinking group to do is to go out with that group and abstain from drinking and then ask yourself, is that who I want to become? Because I think you'll very quickly realize that that's a place where you've been losing momentum, giving up a lot of yourself, and, and it probably isn't who you really want to be. Yep. And sometimes we can't see past it because it's already known. But I think both Alex and I can say that when you get to the other side, um, everything is past it, really. <laughs> yeah. And, and you know what's interesting is um, the people who matter to you, the people who really are connected and really are part of who you are, they will probably follow you. Yeah. You know, and, and I, I've had, I, I can't tell you how many dozens and, and, you know, maybe hundreds of people in, in my life since I quit drinking have done the same. I mean, you know, some of my clients, Annie, that, that like, again, weren't heavy drinkers, but they start working with me and they go, oh, hey, there's this other way to live. Like we don't have to go out on Friday nights and have a few drinks and it's okay to stay home or it's okay to just say no and, and, you know, pass on, on the drinks or pass on the bar part and, and just go out to dinner with people. And they start realizing like, Hey, this adds a lot back to my life. I get a lot of time back, a lot of effort back, a lot of energy back. And the fact is, I think anyone listening to a podcast like yours, anyone who's listening to us, if you're listening to this, I think we both know that there's this tiny little voice in the back of your head that's been whispering to you for far longer than you can remember. That's been saying there's something more here. There's something more important here. You can leave more. You can be more. You can give more back. And you and I both know that there's this small little delusional part of you that says you really can change the world. And I want you to just for right now understand that it's not delusional, that that is the real you. That is who you are. And it's begging to be let out. And the fact that you're here, the fact that you're listening to us confirms that every hallucination you've ever had of what you can do is real and you just need to go do it. I like, honestly, I'm getting choked up and <laughs> chills and I, uh, it's just beautiful and so true. That's just really true. That's awesome. Um, I don't think we could end on anything more profound. <laughs> so if, like I do, you want to binge on much more of Alex's wisdom, <laughs> will you tell us where to find your podcast? Yeah, absolutely. Um, go to MomentumPodcast.com, and it's available on iTunes, Google, and Stitcher, and I'd love to have you as a member. And then um, also, if you'd like to read a little more about the entrepreneurial personality type, you can go to freemomentumbook.com and you can download my book called The Entrepreneurial Personality Type. Understand the attributes, how we behave, why we suppress who we are, how we can let go of that suppression, how we can become the true evolutionary hunter we are and create greater outcomes in the world. Oh, it's been just such a pleasure. Thank you so much, Alex. For sure. Can I leave with one thought, Annie? Yeah, please. I want everyone who's listening to understand something. You know, throughout history, there's been people who have had the behaviors you and I both have. They've had the obsessions and the compulsions and the drive to do more and to be more and to create more. And, and if any one of you just takes a moment right now and think about the timeline of history that matters to you, the people you remember, the people that matter to be remembered, I want you to know something. They were just like us. They struggled and they they strived and they pushed and they experienced pain and they, they went through everything we did. But more importantly, the fact that you're here and the fact that you're asking, can I do more? Can I be more? Should I make this change? Should I make this difference? Is confirmation that that is your tribe. So throughout history, anyone who has changed the world was just like us and your being here includes you in that list. And so if, if you take the time and, and make the decision to elevate you, who you are to a higher level of importance, 
you help me, you help Annie, you help our entire tribe move forward because we all go forward faster together and there is nothing wrong with you and you are not alone. So awesome. So true. Thanks, Annie. Thank you. Thank you. This was a pleasure. I can't wait. This has been Annie Grace with This Naked Mind Podcast. Thank you so much for listening. You can learn more at thisnakedmind.com. And please remember to rate, review, and subscribe as it really helps us spread the word.